thank you very much for your kind words. And so urbanization in, uh, in China is that I've been engaged in a project, four-year project by the European Union on urbanization in China, which finished last year. So and it's the work which is not, four years is definitely not enough to go into all the aspects of urbanization. So I'm still working on the area and probably still kept on working you know, until I'm not a, no longer able to do so. So what I want to do is just to outline some salient features. If something is not clear, please stop me when, when I'm going, because it may be easier just to clarify that issue. So, so let me start with uh, basic information. In 2011, that's about five years ago, for the first time in China's long history, the majority of population were urban. So for all of China's long history, China has been a rural society, and really peasantry and rural areas have played a very important role in, in Chinese history. So in some sense, in a more fundamental sense, it changes the social dynamics of Chinese society. We yet have yet to see its full implication, but in general it would work very differently from what it has done in the past. And the second point I want to make is China obviously might say China has a long history. So urbanization in China must have a long history too. So if you look at the present urban population, almost 60 to 70 percent of it is really dates from uh, the period of reform. So in fact, urbanization in China, most of it has taken place in the last 30 to 35 years. So when the economic reform started in China in 1978, uh, urban areas, something like 80 percent of the population was actually rural. So China was overwhelmingly a rural society. I should mention that rural and urban in China have a very distinctive Chinese meaning. And a lot of areas, rural in China doesn't really look rural, but it's more like very urban. Because population density in China, especially along the coast, is extremely high. So if you compare, uh, as I did some years ago, looking at the rural population density and comparing with the United States and Europe, by American standards, a lot of Chinese rural areas look pretty urban. Rather than, so that, that has certain implications for urbanization, which I'll come to. So, so in terms of, if we look at the main features of Chinese urbanization, it is huge in scale in terms of population. So just to give you an idea that in 34 years, from 1980 to 2014, China's urban population grew by 560 million. And numbers are always big in case of China. This is 16 million per year, uh, a, a, roughly a city size of Shanghai per year. And it, it, it does depend on how you measure Shanghai, but it's still, by world standards, it's huge. And it's going to accelerate. For the reason is that now the Chinese leadership has decided that instead of resisting urbanization as they've done for most of the period 1952, they're going to welcome it and facilitate it. So a lot of people who were uh, treated as rural migrants living and working in cities are going to be, uh, in the next 20 years or so, granted full urban residency rights. So uh, the process is going to accelerate. The second thing is really the physical aspect of urbanization. Is anybody who, who, who's been to China or regularly goes to China is amazed at the rate at which skyscrapers appear. So if you don't go to Beijing for about three or four months, then you go back, some, sometimes you cannot recognize the place because uh, the main landmarks have changed. And second is <coughs> the work proceeds at a very rapid pace. In fact, my, my experience in Beijing is that building laborers work for 24 hours. And so even in the middle of the night, you would see people still working because many of the building laborers are peasants and they come to do a contract job. 
and it's in their interest to finish it as quickly as possible and then to go and do another something else. And the third thing which is important about China, and it's also true for India and other Asian countries, that is urbanization is taking place under very tight or stressful environmental constraints. So in general, in European sense, we say think that before, before urbanization or industrialization, the air was cleaner, the water was unpolluted, and so on. But in China, given population density, and what I say, peri-urban density, it means the rural areas in China already have a lot of urban features. So if uh, problems which are like urban problems also apply to rural areas. So the, in that sense, so the second is very, very serious problem of water shortage in China. The northern half of China is seriously short of water. And the long-term consequences are huge. For example, much of water in northern China is underground water. So uh, underground aquifers are being rapidly depleted. It means that field agriculture, the future of field agriculture in northern China plain is extremely doubtful unless you find some other sources of water. And with urbanization, more and more water is going from uh, farming to urban areas. So this is a long-term consequence of what is the future of agriculture and farming as an industry uh, in northern China. Um, so uh, let me go on to, to so the basic, the way I would look at urbanization in China is that urbanization as everywhere consists of basically two processes. So I would say what are these two processes and, and what form do they take in the Chinese context? So first is the rising share of urban population in the total involving mass rural to urban migration. So migration is actually a feature of Chinese urbanization. Second is urban sprawl, that is steady diversion of rural land for urban development. And so if you've been to China, say, I, mean, I start, my first visit to China was in 1987. And so I went to I was, went to attend a course in Beijing, Chinese course, and also traveled over China and went to Shanghai and so on. So one of the cities called Wuxi, which is uh, uh, which is traditionally known as land of fish and rice, and very famous for its farming. So I went there a year and a half ago, and what I find very shocking is that there is no countryside there; it's almost continuously urban. Similarly, I went to Canton in the south and went to a town called Foshan. We drove back, there was no sign saying this is where Foshan ends and this is where uh, Canton began. So what we see in China and I come to is actually consequences, is the emergence of urban conglomeration which have no boundaries. And if the boundaries are there, they're constantly shifting. So it means that in some sense, what we are going to get, urban pattern in China, is not just growth of large cities, but actually giant urban conglomeration. And that's something which the government actually accepts. So, so what is urbanization with Chinese characteristic? What well, well, the Chinese say, Jungo And so, like, the two institutions, which are particular to China. One is the household registration system, so-called Hukho, and the second is the public ownership of land and its division into collective and state ownership. So Hukho is really part of daily life of Chinese citizens. It affects their life in many different ways. So in some sense, um, for example, in case of education, it, it, this is something which parents have to worry about. And I, come to that. So what is Hukho, which is a population-wide system for recording data on individuals and households, commonly referred to by the locality where the holder is, is resident. So you get names like Beijing Hukho, Shanghai Hukho. And so, so Beijing Hukho can be, have its weight in gold. And I'll come to reason why there is such privilege attached to a particular locality. So it is used for two purposes. 
is used for individual identification. So in that sense, it's very similar to the European uh, ID system. So like France and Germany, you have to have an ID, uh, uh, ID like the uh, United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, don't believe in it, but on the other hand, they have something equivalent in the United States when he said three pieces of identity with your photograph on it. So instead of ID card. But the, so it's the second use of uh, hukou, which makes it uh, particularly Chinese, is really sorting or dividing people for determining access to certain facilities. So when I say access to certain facilities, for example, a lot of social security entitlements are only available to people who are actually resident in a city. Second, as in fact, the, the pre preferential treatment goes much deeper. So one which has attracted attention recently is for young people, that is the university entrance exam, which has a huge influence on a young person's life. Is you only allowed, in most provinces of China, you only allowed to take the university entrance exam if you have the local hukou. And so there have been a lot of problems like, Two years ago, there was a big scandal where a girl who originally parents came from Anhui, which is an interior province, she studied all her life, all her life in Shanghai, but she was not allowed to take the university entrance exam in Shanghai on the grounds that although she's never been to Anhui, she is still officially treated as an unemployed person. So 30% of students in Beijing schools are actually migrant children and who are not allowed to take university entrance exam in Beijing. And why does it matter? It matters greatly because if you have Beijing hukou, then you get privileged access to uh, leading universities in Beijing. So for example, to enter Beijing University, or Tsinghua University, that's China, Two leading universities. If you have Beijing Hukou, you get in with much lower um, marks than if you have an outside Hukou. So they're still trying to change the system. So, and this is accepted in China. So it's just to point out the certain things which would be regarded as very odd in European context. Uh, some others are regarded as almost <laughs> a southern nation in China. That is, in most European countries, the idea that a leading public university sort of discriminates against even depending on the locality where they lived in. You know, there is, could be on two or three years basis, these are students who have spent all their lives in, in the locality. It's, rather, it's certainly strange, but it, I will come to reason why it, it, it is still is there. So, let me just point to one of the reasons why Hukou is so odd. That is, there are two entries in Hukou which are very important. One is the official place of residence, and the second is the, uh, 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 the Hukou status. So uh, the, although these categories are factual, in some sense, place of residence, every ID document will have your address, but in China, because they are used for uh, granting preferences, they are actually control categories. So it's very much similar to what in French call appellation contrôlée, that is to call a wine something. You cannot just say call a champagne, you have to observe certain conditions. So in some sense, um, th these categories are actually no longer factual in that sense. I would come to that is the large number of people in China who actually, uh, uh, their official residence is not where they live and work, and they may be living and working completely different. The second thing, classification which was introduced in 1958 was between agriculture and non-agriculture. At that time, it actually corresponded to the occupation. So basically agriculture was some people who were dependent on farming one way or the other and non-agriculture are basically urban population with certain exceptions. But now, uh, 
Uh, this is the label agriculture is really inherited. So if your parents are classified as agriculture, then you will automatically inherit the label agriculture. So let me give an example. I come to that. The China's urban population uh, is meant to be account 55 percent, but if you look at the people who are classified as non-agriculture, it's only 35 percent. So it means a 20 percentage point of people who are misclassified. Yeah. So let me just indicate the size of what I call anomalous or misclassified population. In 2014, there were some 298 million people, so not a small number. Who, that is over 20% of the total population of China were living and working on a long term basis in a locality other than the one recorded as their home in the Huko. And the proportions and a large majority of them are rural migrants living in urban areas. So in fact, if you take it, what proportion of the population they constitute in urban areas is over 40%. So over 40% of China's urban population is not classified as residents of the locality where they're actually living and working. Proportion is much, high, much higher for Beijing and Shanghai. Both Beijing and Shanghai, majority of residents are actually do not have Hukou, local Hukou. So, so I just say, why does it matter? Because access to a lot of social services, such as education, entitlement to social security benefit, non-contributed social security benefit, access to certain jobs, and even getting certain qualifications, Actually, it depends on whether you have hukou of the locality or not. So it means that basically urbanization in China has created a very segmented population that is in big cities almost uh, more than half of the population do not have access to the facilities which are not provided to the population. So let me give an example of Beijing. And second thing, which is more serious, is that this disadvantage is inherited and passed to generation. So for example, not only affects a migrant living in Beijing, but also equally well applies to migrant children, because hukou is inherited. So more than 30% of school children, school going away children in, in Beijing are actually migrants. And most cases, they cannot go to the local school. The local school do not have places for them. So they go to a special school where the education level may be very poor. So in some sense, the disadvantage is being transmitted across generations. And to education, it can be serious because the work done at Beijing University says that in many, some cases, if the child has stayed in rural area and not migrated to Beijing or Shanghai, his or her education attainment would have been higher if he hadn't migrated. So in general, if he's a migration to town, actually improves education qualification. It does not apply to all migrants in China. Now, I turn to the question of why do these anomalies persist. If it's a question of changing name, you can change the name. And some Chinese cities actually tried to do that some years ago. And, but really, it persists because of public finance reasons. Historically, when China was founded, because government resources were limited, it was decided that it's better to concentrate government subsidies in education, social security, on the urban population, so, uh, so as not to dissipate the effect. But it more or less got institutionalized, so a subsidy per urban citizen is much higher than subsidy per rural citizen or person classified as agriculture. So if you change a person whose status is a rural, rural resident to an urban resident, that is government expenditure to be taken. It's quite substantial. So, and the numbers we are dealing with, as I pointed out, is 298 million people, so most of them. 
So it's, it's a problem which actually cannot be solved simply by changing the name. And, but in 2013, the Central Committee of the Communist Party did decide that is this segmentation has to end. So the plan is by 2020, something like 100 million people, numbers always big for China, are going to transfer uh, status from rural migrant to a permanent urban resident. And then also another 100 million would be transferred to, from coastal area to interior area. Well, so the first one is the most important because it requires a, a very radical reform of the China's public finance system. So let me just indicate that in 1994, China undertook a very uh, important fiscal uh, reform, but it only affected the relationship between provinces and the central government. It did not have an effect at the relationship at the sub-provincial level. And the peculiarity in some sense of China is that most of social expenditure, almost all of social expenditure, is undertaken at the sub-provincial level. So it does not affect education, it does not affect uh, social security. So that reform is still has to be conducted and it has to be part and parcel of any reform of the hukou system. So my own guess is, and actually corroborates with the Chinese thing, that the system, the present distinction, would disappear, but it will not disappear quickly. In some sense, it might take 10 to 15 years, even with, with considerable commitment on parts of the central leadership. Uh, land is publicly owned in China, and in India, for example, it isn't. So uh, one natural question one would ask, what difference does it make to urbanization? And obviously it should be important because an important aspect of urbanization is physical, that is expansion of urban areas into the surrounding rural areas. Well, in China, the, the public, owner, public ownership is divided into state ownership, which is equated with urban areas. And rural, uh, uh, public ownership in rural areas is equated with collective ownership. Collective is basically refers to public institutions which do not re regard as uh, a status of government. So it really applies to grassroots level in rural areas. So the important point for present purposes is that because the di division between state-owned and collectively owned coincides with urban and rural, so with urbanization there has to be constantly shifting boundaries between urban and rural. So before a piece of rural land can be used for urban purposes, it has to be first acquired and transformed into state property, and then auction, uh, lease auction uh, for urban development. And this <coughs> process can only be conducted by cities. So in some sense, like every country, if you take a piece of land and say agricultural land and say it can be used for urban purposes, if its value goes up, maybe as much as 300% or 1,000%. But in China, most of that is appropriated by cities. Very small proportion actually accrues to peasants. So first, is there's a great deal of disenchantment in the rural population with the low level of com compensation. But it also means that it has provided cities with a ready source of finance. So what is very striking in China compared to other Asian cities is the infrastructure in China is so much better than other areas. So part of it is explained by public ownership of land. There's the cities. Actually, we get most of the, mm, most of the revenue. But there is, I mean, like all good stories, there, there is a limit to that. The limit is that cultivable area in China is very limited. So, for example, China covers a large territory, but only 15% of it is actually cultivable. In India, the uh, area is not as large, but 50% of Indian territory is actually cultivable. So, what it means is that this urban expansion has also cut into the cultivable land. <coughs> 
So the central government has to constantly control this process of urban sprawl in order to preserve cultivable land. So it means that process of relying on the way uh, uh, local governments collect revenue from land is really not sustainable over time. They have to find some other ways of actually collecting income. Well, let me just press on to uh, just look at, <coughs> I want to look at the, what, what do uh, cities and towns look like in China. There's something like 666 cities in China. They are hierarchically divided. Four cities have the status of provinces. These are Beijing, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Chongqing. And then some cities in the middle that really constitute the core of urban areas are called prefecture level cities, of which about <coughs> 260. And then there are small cities, which are county level cities. And I want to comment on one aspect of policy of the Chinese government that is traditionally. Chinese government has always emphasized, says that it favors the expansion of a small and medium-sized town and really restrict the growth of large town. But it hasn't really happened. For example, in fact, growth, big, big towns have grown much faster than small towns. Second towns on the eastern seaboard have grown much faster than in the, in the interior. For a simple reason, they offer better economic opportunity. <coughs> and so uh, it means that this is an area where the policy, the second thing is the policy is actually non-sustainable. If you think of this way, that if the policy were really successful, then the small towns and medium-sized towns would grow into big cities. So after some time, in, what you will see is really expansion of a small and medium sized city, and they would be automatically classified big cities. So, what is, in, is happening apart from growth of big towns is given the high population density in China rural areas, what we see imagine that cities grow, they might internet cities next to them. So, what, what an effect, what you see in China is rise of urban conglomeration where you get a continuous urban area and without any boundaries. So in some sense, rural areas in ordinary central time actually disappear. So next two or three decades, what we'll see China is the urbanization rate will continue and grow. There would be obviously towns and cities, but also we see the emergence of five to six giant urban metropolitan region. That is one in northern China, that is, is already Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province, with a population of around 120 million. Then one around Shanghai, which is really Ningbo to, to Nanjing, is more or less like already an urban conglomeration with a population of about 160 million people. One in the south of China, which is Guangzhou and Hong Kong, that we are dealing with well over 200 million people. So these are, uh, these uh, metropolitan regions is something which we've never experienced in world history. The largest conglomeration, urban conglomeration now is the Tokyo Bay with 28 million people. So I'll just say, what prob wh why do they pose a particular problem? They pr pose a particular problem if you ask the question, who will finance the infrastructure for this entity? Because they do not fit in any administrative boundaries. So in now in Beijing, the central government is supporting the development of what we call Jing Jin Ji, which is uh, the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, and a lot of infrastructure is being financed by the central government. But after it's completed, you know, how would the responsibility divide it? Second, the idea is that um, uh, uh, administrative region. The second is what actually happens to economic division. 
So this is one way the Chinese government wants to counteract so-called the tendency of cities to replicate each other. So if uh, China has too many steel mills, I mean, why? Not because central government actually authorized them, because many cities said, if such and such city has a steel mill, we are going to have one too. So, so the idea is that competitive industrialization is what partly responsible for example, huge surplus capacity in steel, and we're also going to get it in car. So this idea that if you have a bigger region, then it might control it. And second, why it's important, is for environmental purposes. So uh, Beijing environmental problems are, are, are well known, but one idea is that Beijing has been closing down all factories, so capital steel works have been closed down in Beijing. But pollution levels are not affected. So they move next door to Hebei province. So instead of pollution originating from Beijing, you have one originating from the neighboring province. And by the general situation remains the same. So the idea of what economists say, if you have a bigger region, then you would, you would take into account the environmental aspect. So it remains to be seen. But that's the, the thinking behind the emergence of this region in the northern area. So, I think what are the things we would want to say in China? It is generally accepted that really there is no alternative in China that is but to accept rapid urbanization. So it really the question is not whether to have towns and not towns, because you get exactly the same problem in areas classified as rural. So, so having much higher uh, rural population is actually often tantamount to uh, calling an area which is urban in all respects except name. So part of it accepting people who are migrants as uh, urban citizens, because that's the reality. In reality, they are urban citizens. So I, I think that, and it's only then that you know, China can have a, a, an urbanization policy. And the second is that what, what is very clear that uh, government cannot control the size of town, cities. It is because you know, in China, government is powerful, leadership is powerful, it can do many things. But what it cannot do is to say Beijing's population cannot go beyond 20 million because it will grow, but it will just take form, which are never intended. So let me uh, end here and I'd be happy to take comments and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you.